Redefined is hosted by me, Zainab Salbi, and brought to you by Find Center, a search engine for your soul. Part library, part temple, Find Center presents a world of wisdom, organized. Check it out today at www.findcenter.com and please subscribe to Redefined for free on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. What's most important about life? What is the essence of life? Is it what we do? How much we earn? How many social media followers we have? Or is it, do we live our lives in kindness to ourselves and to others? Do we live our lives in love to ourselves and to others? In nearly losing my life, I was confronted with these questions and it led me to the conversations that make up Redefined about how we draw our inner maps and the pursuit of meaningful personal change. My guest this time is best-selling author Elif Shafak. A woman born of two worlds, Elif is one of the most formidable and insightful writers of our time. Her TED Talks have brought her both praise and criticism, and her novels, The Forty Rules of Love and The Bastard of Istanbul, have made her a household name. I just finished her latest work, The Island of Missing Trees, and her recent essay collection, How to Stay Sane in an Age of Division, and found her writings, as always, to be essential. These books cut across boundaries and binaries. The worlds she creates are layered and nuanced, They challenge us all to see things more thoroughly, more completely, and more compassionately. Please join me for this unique discussion as we explore division and unity, sweetness and strength, displacement and belonging. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Join me. How are you doing? Oh, it's so good to see you, Zaina. It's so good seeing you. So good seeing you. You know, I've been really immersing myself, especially in your last two books, How to Stay Sane in an Age of Division, and the one I really couldn't get take down at all, The Island of Missing Trees. It's just they're profoundly I like I can't wait to go back to the book every time I have to stop reading. And as I was reading it, I like I, I thought of the word suhbet. Mm-hmm. It's an Arabic word. It's a Turkish word as well. For me, suhbet is like a soul friendship, you know, um, a friendship with someone where you're like resonating with what they are saying. And they're different. They're somewhere else, but they are resonating with their message. And I call people like you or me even people of the bridge. You know, we are neither here nor there. There is no complete belonging in one place or one idea or one identity. How does it feel to live on the bridge? What an amazing, what a beautiful question. And may I also say I have so much love and respect for your work and your voice. So this is very special to me. And I think at the root of Sohbet, this conversation, there is muhabbet, the way I see it, there's love. There's a sense of kindred spirits. So I'm so happy that we're starting with this feeling of bridges, connections, but also perhaps an in-between them, which has a double edge because on the one hand, you do feel connected to multiple places and there's an enrichment to that. But also I think there's a sense of maybe melancholy. You're at home in many places, but also you're a little bit more nomadic at least intellectually or spiritually, sometimes physically too. But at the same time, I'm someone who deeply, passionately believes in multiple belongings. And I think we live in a world that does not allow us to bring out our own multitudes. When I look at myself, of course, I'm an Istanbulite. And I think my love for the city is very visible in my work. It keeps coming with me. But I also feel attached to the Balkans. I have elements in my soul from the Middle East that I will always carry with me. I want to think um, that I'm a citizen of the world, you know. So multiple, multiple belongings. 
uh, and and I think literature art is the best way to bring out that multiplicity. And you do it, and you know, and you say actually in your in your book how to stay sane in an age of division is that do not be afraid, uh, right? Yeah, do not be afraid of complexity. Be afraid of people who promise an easy shortcut to simplicity. I find it interesting because you keep on pushing the complexity aspect and the pushing the multiple identities and you keep on getting attacked for it. And I, I don't know if the attack only in the uh, only in from Turkey, because because you're as critical of of West, of some Western uh, beliefs as well, you know, but I'm not sure if I didn't see attack there. But you're critical of the stereotype and the cornering and the simplification of identity that also comes from the West. But you keep at it. I mean, you you are someone who went on trial, let's say, for insulting the very notion of Turkish identity for your book, The Bastard of Istanbul. And on the one hand, and you're someone who created a social uproar in Turkey for your last TED Talk, I believe it was 2017, for diversity and reasons of reasons, including talking about your sexuality. And yet you keep on pushing, like you're relentless in saying, "Mm, I'm going to keep on going. What keeps you going? What what holds you? You, you know, in my in my daily life, I'm a very anxious person. Uh, I have a lot of self doubt, and and so there is a difference between, I think, the dynamics of daily life, the emotions that we all struggle with, confusion, anger, anxiety. I think this is the age of pessimism, and all of that affects authors as well. We're not immune to any of that. However, when I'm in the middle of a novel. I feel so free, you know, I really love the art of storytelling. And that is the only place where I can bring out all my multiplicity. And I think it is not a coincidence that the novel in particular is one of our last remaining democratic spaces where we can still hear a diversity of opinions, empathize with people whom we thought as our other, connect both emotionally and intellectually, and and maybe shift our cognitive perspective angle a little bit. So I do believe in the power of stories. I love the art of storytelling. That said, it's not easy to be a writer in Turkey. It's a heavy experience. And I'm going to take a step further and I'm going to claim that it's even heavier to be a woman writer. Because of course, obviously on the one hand, as a writer, you have to deal with the lack of freedom of speech, the lack of democracy, all of which makes it very, very difficult because anything you say might offend the authorities. But also when you are a woman and, and, and when you're a feminist, and if you question gender stereotypes, gender violence, those issues are not easy either. So you might be writing about sexuality, you might be right, talking about gender discrimination, and you can still offend some people. There's no end to that. It's not an easy climate. It's not an easy environment for for authors. It's a bit surreal too, because, you know, a work of fiction can be put on trial and suddenly you you can see fictional characters in a way being sued uh, because the words of fictional characters are taken out of the book. That's what happened with the Bastard of Istanbul, uh, because this is a book that talks about memory, amnesia, and it talks about the Armenian genocide which is um, still a very big taboo in Turkey. It's a subject that we find very difficult to talk about in Turkey. But because the words of fictional characters were used as evidence in the courtroom, my Turkish lawyer had to defend my Armenian fictional characters. And that madness went on for about a year. There were ultranationalist groups on the streets burning EU flags, spitting out my pictures. Um, So it was quite upsetting. But at the end of that a year, I was acquitted and the fictional characters were acquitted with me. So it's, it's, it can be quite surreal as well being a, being a novelist in Turkey. But how do you deal with it, Elif? Because as, a, as someone from the Middle East myself, you know, I'm from Iraq and there's um, a special place in my heart, of course, for my homeland, you know, and my culture and my people. And yet when I'm criticized there and called all kinds of names for being a feminist and a women's rights activist. I would lie to you if I told you if it didn't, it didn't hurt me. It hurt me. Uh, 
It scared me. It hurt me. It broke my heart a million times and broke my family's heart. You know, like here I am going with love and dedication and you are my people. And then it's just like pff, attacks, you know, how do you deal with that on a just on a personal level? How do you reconcile that love and that pain? Yes, and as you said, I mean, the easier thing would be to turn your back and walk away. But what you're doing, Zainab, is quite the opposite. You care about the people. You care about equality, you know, justice. Uh, and you care about empowering the disempowered. So you keep going back. You keep connecting. You choose the hard path. Um, and it's not easy when we are criticized in this way in our own lands, in our own motherlands, I should say. There's an emotional hurt there that I'm not going to deny either. And it, it scars you, you know. So um, therefore, I, I think I have these mixed feelings. On the one hand, when I think about the people in Turkey, especially women, especially youth, young people, especially minorities, I really feel more hopeful. And there are amazing people whose voices we never hear, perhaps in Western media, but they are there and they believe in a proper democracy. Uh, and their very existence is very important. But on the other hand, when I look at politics in Turkey and politicians in Turkey, I feel very depressed. I am also aware of the fact that this is a very conservative society and um, there is misogyny, there's internalized misogyny, there's internalized sexism and there's internalized uh, homophobia. So none of these are easy issues and the moment you talk critically, you can easily be labeled as a traitor, as the other. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very mixed feeling. You know, you get both hatred, but also you get love. And perhaps paradoxically, in places where there is no proper democracy or freedom of speech, stories matter even more. And in Turkey, it's always heartwarming for me to see a book is not a personal item. When, if, if and when a reader likes a book, she doesn't put it back on the bookshelf. She passes it on. The neighbor reads it and the neighbor sends it to her son and the aunt reads it and others, someone else reads, reads it. So I have seen in my book signings, books that have been underlined by different colored pens because five or six different people have read the same copy. So that kind of word of mouth, that kind of sharing of stories is, is very, very beautiful and important. And that gives me hope. But as you said, I mean, when I look at the politics and the way arts and creativity is, is treated, it's, it's heartbreaking. But how do you deal with that heartbreak? I mean, so you're saying the youth keeps you going, basically. I mean, do you do you have friends that you go to? Do you have a, a value, I believe? Because I mean, like, and I ask because, you know, there are times in which I was asked to stop talking, you know, by my own family in my case. And... And, and, and I had to like go into that paradigm of, okay, do I stop talking to keep peace, <laughs> you know, and, uh, or do I continue to talk and I will risk losing a lot. I will risk the attacks and, you know, it, it, they are a violation of your soul, if you may, you know. And it's always what kept me going is just um, is that if I stop, I will die. Like I will like my soul will die. So I rather, you know, keep talking and, and, and handle the attack and rather than stop and die slowly in, in my silence. How, how do you handle that? How do you, how, what's your process of saying, I, I will keep going? You know, I want to speak up uh, about issues that I genuinely care about, whether it's women's rights, LGBTQ plus rights, democracy, pluralism, there has to be an emotional connection between who we are and what we do. I love the art of storytelling. And when I retreat into a novel, I try to forget this so-called real world, because if I start worrying about what people are going to say, how they're going to receive my next novel, I can't write. You know, I'll feel paralyzed. So I try to just not think about any of that. And I don't have a single reader in mind because I do know that every reader will bring their own gaze into the story. To me, it's fascinating that, that you know, couples who've been married for 45 years, they read the same book, but they don't read it in the same way. Very dear friends, they read the same book. One of them loves it, the other one not so much. Why? Because everyone comes with their own gaze, with their own story into a novel. I love that openness. 
But I think my job as a storyteller is to ask questions, not necessarily try to give answers, but to ask questions, including difficult questions about difficult issues and create an open space where a diversity of opinions can be heard. Doing that makes me happy. I also try to keep in mind that, you know, look, you, you're sharing with me your story, I'm sharing mine, and then we realize actually we're not alone. We women need to keep talking about all of this. There was a UN report recently, which was carried out across multiple countries that shows, especially in the last years, the abuse that women in the public space have been receiving has escalated. So whether you're a woman politician or a journalist or a novelist or a filmmaker, a, a, a very, very worrying amount of abuse, including sexist abuse, will be piled on you. We need to understand that we have to um, change digital spaces. None of this is, uh, is okay, but also we need to understand that we're not alone in this. And I think that too helps. Absolutely. And uh, for me is, you know, your friendship, uh, Elif, is where even though we don't see each other that often, I really do feel what I'm, I'm not alone in this, even it's been years since we've seen each other. So but it, it you do that for me and, and your novels do that for me. And I really appreciate it. Um, talking about women, I want to talk about our grandmothers, grand your grandmother and mine and and I, you know, because you talk a lot about your grandmother, and how she raised you particularly you were born in France and then you um, went to Turkish to Turkey as a young youngster with a single mother who was then uh, raised by your grandmother as your mother went and finished her education and I the reason I, I mention your grandmother is be, for many reasons one is telling her daughter your mother that she needs to go and get education and stand on her feet uh, for a better future for you and she needs to do the same for you right and then the second reason is that you also talk about a grandmother who is a spiritual person, who is wise, who, uh, as I read and hear about your own description of her, the religion, Islam, that she um, embodied was kindness and spiritual and not imposing. And maybe I'm impo maybe I'm projecting by the way, because that's how my grandmother was, right? She was a very spiritual woman. And on her own, she never imposed anything on us. Um, and she actually was a storyteller. So she would like tell these stories for hours and hours and hours that impacted me profoundly. And the reason and, and made the same thing with her daughters, right? She made sure that all of her daughters go to college so they can have a better life. My grandmother was married at 13. So she made sure that all of her kids go to college. And then she, the daughters made sure all their daughters, including myself, have even pushed them even further. And in my case, my mom like pushed me out of the country, just like go so you can become who you are. And yet when I think about the reason I say our grandmothers, because that spirituality and kindness and wisdom, it feels has, um, I would hate to say eradicated, but maybe um, shrank uh, in the region, you know, and it was taken over by much more dogma, rigidity, and very black and white aspects of religion and tradition and all of that. And so in hindsight, my grandmother died many years ago. And sometimes when I remember her, and I remember her often, I was like, thank God she's dead. Not to see what has happened, you know, the degradation of, of forget the religion being a religion, but the degradation of a beauty and a culture and a value that really has, in my opinion, been diluted to a great extent. What do you think of when you think of your grandmother and how would she feel about today? Mm. You know, I, I think there are lots of things in common between uh, our grandmothers. And to me, it's fascinating that my grandmother, she was not a very well-educated woman because she had been denied a proper education uh, just because she was a girl, she was taken out of school and she was someone who wholeheartedly believed in women's education, in girls' education. And she held this opinion that if you give more to the next generation, and then if only they could give more to the very next generation, the world would be a better place. 
I am a big believer in sisterhood, in women empowering each other. I think it means nothing if we have a few, let's say, successful or well-known, whatever. I don't like those terms either. But women in, in one field and then in business and then in politics, a few there, a few here, that means nothing unless we empower each other and, and realize that you know we, we can only um, make proper change if we include all women. And also we're aware of these class distinctions, racial uh, discrimination, ethnic, regional, digital divisions. So it has to be more intersectional. I, as a feminist, I believe in the kind of women's movement that opens up conversations and does not retreat into, into tribes. But many of that, I think, came to me from my own upbringing. The, the very fact that I was raised by these two women. I grew up without seeing my, my father uh, and he stayed in France. He got married again. And as you said, my mother brought me to Turkey and I was brought up by these two women who were completely different personalities and yet they supported each other. And I realized when women support each other, the impact of that goes beyond generations. I've also learned from my grandmother that, you know, I'm someone who has dedicated her life to books and knowledge, and intellectual creativity. But I learned from her that there are different paths to wisdom. And there are many people who maybe don't have a diploma and they're so wise. And there are many people who have a diploma and they are so ignorant. So you can't just, you know, associate knowledge or, or wisdom with, with just a piece of paper. Uh, she made me think more carefully about the distinction between information, knowledge and wisdom. But coming back to what you said, which is so important, we've lost that sense of humor to a large extent in the region to be able to, you know, make fun lightness, the pleasures, joke about authority and rigidity, um, but the kind of compassionate humor, not the kind of humor that looks down upon. My grandmother was also funny. You know, these are women who were oral storytellers. They transferred a, an accumulation of knowledge from one generation to another, but they would also make fun of those, all those rigidities and dogmas, which I think is a good thing, is a healthy thing. Faith without doubt is a dogma and dogmas are very, very dangerous. So let faith and doubt talk to each other, let them challenge each other, let them dance together. Um, but it, in a nutshell, I think what I'm trying to say is there cannot be proper social progress if women are not included equally in the public space and in the decision-making processes. If you exclude half of the population, if you exclude minorities, how is that society ever going to change? So it is very important that, you know, sometimes people say, okay, let's achieve democracy first and then we will solve up, we will solve women's rights. There's no such thing. You can't postpone minority rights or women's rights. And without them, there cannot be real progress. I mean, that's very true. I mean, in many nationalistic movements and liberation movements even sacrifice women's rights. And they said, well, stop for a side, we need to build the nation first and then we'll revisit you. And it has proven over and over and over to have failed and that we cannot uh, compromise that anymore. And as a matter of fact, I really be believe, believe that this century, the 21st century, needs to be the feminine century. If it's not, then we have our humanity at stake. And, and I mean feminine century as in, you know, bringing our feminine values, your grandmother's values, my grandmother's values, my mother, my, myself, all of that into how we operate into the world. And because, you know, what at stake really is our own humanity because of the crisis we have created on earth, you know. I'm assuming your mom, your, your grandmother rather, have passed away I assume I don't know yeah what does she leave you in terms of feminine values what are the things that she installed on you that to keep on going as you are a mother now you know she was a very kind person she had genuine compassion in her heart I think you know I experienced these two sides on the one hand I felt unloved as I was growing up because I knew my father was a really good father to his other children, but I felt like I was the forgotten child. But I also experienced the very opposite and I felt very much loved, uh, dearly loved by my grandmother and mother. So two op opposites I've experienced uh, growing up. 
And it was thanks to her mostly because uh, she was incredibly compassionate, but also non-judgmental. She did not judge people. And interestingly, she did not like to gossip. Uh, people would come to her house. So many people would come to our house at the time because my grandmother was a bit of a healer. And she also maybe taught me about the power of words because in all those superstitions, I mean, there was magic in, a, in her house. Uh, there's an emphasis on the power of the spoken words, which is quite interesting, or the written word. And many things stayed with me. This was a time in Turkey when there was a lot of political conflicts, 19... 70s, late 1970s, I'm talking about, there would be, you know, violence on the streets, but inside the house, there, there was magic. So I remember sitting by the window and thinking about these two worlds, um, the, the, the conflicts in the streets, and the magic and stories within my grandmother's house. And maybe to this day, my work, my books try to bridge uh, you know, both the reality as I see it, but also understand oral culture. I've never looked down upon that world. And as much as I can, I would love to bridge written culture with oral culture. So I don't want to divide it into feminine values or non-feminine values, but I think she, what she left me with is this notion that I wholeheartedly believe in. Life is much more fluid than we recognize. Identity is much more fluid and we're all on a journey and we're learning. I love people who can say, I don't know. When was the last time we ever said, I don't know? We've forgotten how to say that. You know, you can ask me anything and everything. If I don't know the answer, I can Google it. And in the next five minutes, I'll be able to say a few words about the subject, giving me the illusion that I know something about the subject. But in fact, I know nothing. So we forgot to understand our own ignorance. That's why I think we live in an age in which there's way too much information but very little knowledge and even less wisdom. And wisdom requires to be able to say, I don't know, I'm learning, I'm a student of life. It's an ongoing open-ended discovery. I'm changing, I'm becoming. That kind of a fluid world is, was my grandmother's world. Mm, that's so beautiful. But I wanna go back to your father now because you, you mentioned him a couple of times now and, um, and you had one, in one uh, I think to the Guardian, you said, or, or several other places, you said you have healed your relationship with your father, who is no longer with us. How did you heal your relationship? You saw him again in your 20s, and you realize he's a good father to his sons. How, I'm curious, how did you heal your relationship with your father? Uh, actually, healing took such a long time because I had a lot of anger. So, yes, I did see him in my early 20s, but by then I was so angry. I was fuming. I had this rage inside. And anger is a very interesting source of energy. I mean, the beginning of anger can be quite uplifting. This might sound controversial, but there is a power to anger or there's an energy to it. But the problem with anger is that in the long run, it becomes repetitive and it becomes toxic and it starts to destroy you from within. Um, I, I'm not someone who underestimates seemingly negative emotions such as anxiety or anger or frustration or disappointment or even confusion. I think all of these can be good sources of energy if only we can turn them into something more constructive and positive, both for ourselves individually, but also for our communities and societies. That is perhaps the most difficult thing. So for a very long time, I had this clash I tried to understand why he was so absent in my life. And I never got a satisfactory answer from a human being who was very intelligent, who was, you know, who was very articulate otherwise, but he, was, he couldn't articulate his own emotions. So maybe he made me also understand two things. First of all, maybe the importance of emotional intelligence, uh, that it is a different type of intelligence but also my own broken relationship with my father made me understand as a storyteller that we're very complex beings as human beings. You know, we all have these multiplicities. You can be a very good professor. You can be very good at your job, but you can fail miserably perhaps in your personal relationship with your wife or with one of your children. It is possible, you know, layer upon layer. That doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you an absolutely good person. It's we're all somewhere in between. They're all shades along that spectrum uh, or, you know, different 
um, uh, colors along the same spectrum. So it, it helped me to reevaluate my understanding of what a human being is. The healing or the um, making some kind of peace happened much later after I became a parent because I wanted him to see his own grandchildren and I never wanted what happened between us to affect his own relationship with his grandchildren because they're each an individual, you know, and he should be able to build a relationship with his own grandchildren separate from what happened between us. But of course, it's not easy. I mean, there are scars, there are, I'm sure he, he carried his own scars as well. But the, 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 when I managed to get over that feeling of anger, which took me a long time, I think I felt a sense of lightness. When I realized that I was not angry at him anymore, uh, it was better, you know. So it made our relationship better, but also within me, it made me a calmer, relatively calmer person. But how did you do that? Because I had, you know, different story and I had issues with my father. And in my case, the work happened on, I did the work on my own. It wasn't in dialogue with him. It was, I had to dig deeper into seeing him as a full human, you know, as you said, you know, rather than my father, but just seeing all elements of him and then seeing his wholeness, you know, his fullness rather helped me release my anger to him. And so the relationship in my case healed, not because she showed up and said, let's heal it. It's because I was carrying that heavy baggage and I had to work on it to dissolve it. And once that happened, it held. How did you do it? I'm, I'm just curious. Was it in dialogue or it seems that you did it on your own as well? Uh, I did it very much on my own because when he showed up, he wasn't there to build a dialogue. He just wanted to, you know, carry on as if nothing has happened. All these years of absence are not there. So he wasn't emotionally responsive. He wanted to talk about books. He was an intellectual and he felt very much comfortable um, when we were talking about books, philosophers, ideas, which is lovely. But when it comes to emotions and facing our own truth and the things that we have missed out and why is it like that, he was not very willing to go in that direction. So like you, I had to do the work myself. Sometimes I failed miserably, uh, but I kept trying and trying. I had to work on my own anger. I had to try to understand him, but also accept him, you know, that this is who he is with his own weaknesses, with his own flaws and the things that he never wanted to face. That was him. Uh, after that, I think I felt, I felt freer. So it's, it's an internal work that you have to do very much on your own. Where is your mother in this picture? Where is your mother in here? She left... Um, you know, has a great impact on my life, upbringing. She's a feminist and she's always been very sensitive, um, conscious, you know, about gender inequality. But not only what she says puts into words her very life, you know, growing up, observing a single mother, working mother in late 1970s Ankara, you, it just opens up your eyes and you, you observe what she's going through emotionally, the challenges. There came a time when my mother became a diplomat, but this happened around the time I was 10, 11 years old, which was a bit unusual. Uh, as you mentioned, when we came back from France, she was a very young divorcee. She had no diploma, no money, nothing to fall back on. And usually women in such situations are immediately married off, usually to someone older, because they're not very favorable in the marital market anymore. And because it was my grandmother who intervened and he said, you go back to university, build your life again. Uh, in my early years, I think I, you know, I did not see her that much, um, but she managed to graduate with a very high average and eventually she became a diplomat. She learned many languages on her own. So there's a lot of struggle, you know, a lot of work that she put forth on her own. And I respect her so much for that. And then she and I, we went to Madrid, Spain, where I started learning English. Um, and in that regard, I think I've, I grew up observing my mother's struggles. And she in Turkey? Yes, she's in Turkey. 
beautiful. She must be very, very proud of you because I think it's because to for when mothers see their daughters becoming. You know, I uh, I have an aunt. Uh, my mom is passed away, but I have an aunt in Iraq. Uh, and as I told you, my grandmother made sure all the daughters are going into college and they became feminists and, you know, all for women's rights and women's independence and all of that. And and my aunt got into religion and she is very observant right now and she wears a headscarf and she prays the right and night, day and night. And one day out of the blue called me and, you know, she's in Iraq, Baghdad, and I'm here and then in New York, and she says, Zainab, I just want to tell you in English, you go, girl. <laughs> and she's like, you're doing what we're not able to do, so you go, girl. And it was so beautiful, you know, because it was more like, Getting their endorsement, they're getting their push, getting their love uh, means a lot, you know, just to say, hey, I'm hearing you, I'm acknowledging you. Just one thing, I mean, you, you, you inspire me, listening to you is so inspiring. I, I think that means so much, that is so important. And we don't have enough solidarity among women, especially in the region. And sometimes it really breaks my heart, understandably, for psychological reasons, women who themselves have suffered a lot, they're almost like, okay, it's someone else's turn to suffer now. You know, in very, very traditional settings, you can have the elder women in the family being uh, not very understanding towards the, the struggles that the younger women are going through. You know, we need to break that chain, that patriarchal chain. I also find it problematic that in patriarchal societies, actually, we have matriarchal households. We respect our grandmothers, you know, culturally in Iraq, in Turkey, across the Middle East. But we respect women only and only when they are desexualized, defeminized in our minds, in the public eye. We don't see grandmothers as women anymore. They're in a different category altogether, which means if you're a woman, until you are deemed to be old in the eyes of the society, you will not get respect, whatever you do. And that is incredibly debilitating. So we need to be aware of how, I mean, we have amazing women in so many fields, but unless we support each other, unless we have a proper sisterhood and solidarity, nothing is going to change. It's so true. Yeah. You know, you're making me think that a lot of it has to do with the sexuality of women. So we tell the girls, you have to be, you know, good girl and you have to keep your virginity and all of these things. So now you're suppressing, you know, any expression of the girl. And then she becomes a woman and she gets married and she's supposed to be a very good wife, you know, showing up for her husband and whatever sexual needs that he has is again to serve the husband's needs. And then, you know, she evolves into the grandmother and that's when she really has a voice is because she is now asexual. And so we can actually listen to her. So, so true. Elif, you broke a huge taboo in the entire Middle East. I would assume maybe less in Turkey because Turkey tends to be a bit more uh, liberal uh, than the entire Middle East, but maybe not. When you talked uh, in your TED Talk about your own sexuality, how, and, and it just like, poof, it created an uproar. Um, how, what are your thoughts about that? And what are your answers to that? Because we all know, you know, sexual expressions in the Middle East happens as any other country is the region of the world. And yet it's suppressed and not talked about, you know, and so those who do talk about get attacked. How, what's your message to that? How, how did you handle that also? I, I, I'm not sure that Turkey is more liberal when it comes to talking about sexuality. It might seem to be on the surface, when, but when you scratch the surface, Underneath, it's the same old patriarchy, it's the same old homophobia and misogyny. And we don't, we find it very, very difficult to talk about uh, sexuality in, in particular, but also sexual minorities. Coming back to my story, I think it's very visible in my writing uh, that there is always a desire to give more voice to minorities, including sexual minorities. And throughout my adult life, I've been very vocal about my support for LGBTQ plus rights, you know, in all my interviews, public talks. But the truth is, I never had the courage to say this is also my story. You know, it has a personal connection to me. I, for a long time, I thought about it and I, you know, I kept thinking, shall I, shall I 
talk about this in the public space or just keep it in my writing, in my fiction, in my interviews? Does it really matter? But, but the, the very honest truth is I was, I was scared of the reaction that I would get in Turkey because I knew I would get, receive a lot of hate speech, that I would get a lot of verbal abuse, all kinds of things but also ridicule, you know, be, be, I would be belittled. And from all sides, I was aware of this. So until my mid forties, I never had the courage to own who I am in that sense in the public space. And I always kept it in my fiction and in my interviews. I wish I had the courage to do so earlier, but I also respect anyone, you know, people have different stories, people go through different journeys. So there's no point in pushing anyone in any direction. However, when we are ready to co come out, I think we should come out because it's very important to be able to say first and foremost, this is who I am, you know, whether you like it or not, regardless, this is my reality, this is my truth and I want to be able to speak my truth. But also when you do that, maybe it's a little message to someone else who might be feeling very lonely and maybe... You know, I, I received incredibly moving letters, particularly from parents who have children who might be going through, you know, similar things. So that to me is very moving. Uh, but, the, but the sad side was after the TED talk was um, shared online, uh, I'm not exaggerating Zeynep, I think it went on for nine weeks uninterrupted, constant, constant abuse all over social media, but also papers, newspapers in Turkey, Islamist papers, ultranationalist papers, columnists, making fun, saying awful things, the amount of hatred and verbal abuse every day. Uh, that, was, that, that was tough. But I think I did it at a time when I was ready to, to face that storm. I was ready to navigate that storm. And I'm so glad I was able to share it. When you say you were ready, I'm glad you were able to share it also, because... Again, for me, when we don't share our truth, it's death for me. It's, you know, and I, I will refuse to die in silence. I rather die screaming, you know. And because I've seen so many mother, women died in their silence. You know, it's like that's, that's what keeps me going. Because I've seen my own mother die in silence and my grandmother die. And I was like, I'm not going to do that again. Like there's no goodness that comes out of silence. So, but my question is, do you have a support group, a support system that hold you in when a storm like that happens? How, well, like, do you go to therapy? Do you go, like, what, seriously, just on a very practical level, what do you do? Do you, do you like, just hold your, your spine? You know, when um, I mentioned, when I shared I was bisexual, I received so many letters and emails and words of support and solidarity from people of all backgrounds and all countries, you know, some of them from the LGBTQ community, some of them from completely different, you know, backgrounds. But that kind of humanity, that kind of love was very, very moving. So from all over the world, you get lots of positive messages, but from your own motherland, you get all kinds of negativity. And that hurts like nothing else hurts. Oh, absolutely. I know that. I want to go to The Island of Missing Trees. Truly, truly beautiful book about forbidden love, collective trauma, and the cost of having to leave home to start a new life. Um, can you talk about the challenges of writing it and what kind of self-reflections was needed to tell that story? This is a novel that takes place in Cyprus and also the UK, um, maybe some of your listeners might not know this, but the UK became my adopted country. I've been in this country for more than 12 years now, and I feel attached to, to this land uh, as well, deeply. But the truth is, I have been wanting to write about Cyprus for a very, very long time. And there's no doubt in my mind, this is a beautiful island with beautiful people, north and south. And yet, it is not an easy story to tell, because it is a land that has experienced partition, division, ethnic violence, civil war. As we're speaking, there is an actual di division uh, frontier there that is separating Christians from Muslims, 
Greek Cypriots from Turkish Cypriots, a border that is guarded by UN troops. So when we're talking about Nicosia, we're talking about the, the last divided capital in Europe. And it's also a place where the past is not a bygone affair. It's not left behind and closed doors. I think the past is very much alive and breathing within this present moment. So Cyprus is a place where there are unhealed wounds and clashing memories. Depending on whom you ask, you might get a different version of history. And therefore the challenge for me was, how do you tell the story of a place that has been ravaged by division and partition without yourself falling into the trap of nationalism as a storyteller, without you, yourself falling into the trap of tribalism. And I could never find that angle into the story, that opening, until I found the voice of a fig tree. And finding that tree gave me a completely different opening window into the story because first and foremost, you realize whenever, wherever humans have destroyed each other, it's not only human lives that are that, that perish, it's also an entire ecosystem, trees and animals and plants. So that was important to me, but also thinking about the voice of the fig tree gave me an opportunity to write about roots. What does it feel like to be uprooted, displaced, almost deracinated, rootless, rerooted? All of these questions about belonging, exile, displacement, which are very important to me as well. Uh, are part of the story. So in a nutshell, this is a love story. It's a forbidden love, you might say, but it's also a story that deals with intergenerational memories. We always talk about family stories, but what about family silences? It deals with inherited pain, and it is the story of a fig tree. It's so beautiful. It's, it's truly, I can't recommend it enough. It's a beautiful, beautiful reading. I have few quick uh, last questions, uh, rapid questions about books that inspire you, uplift you, give you solace, joy, uh, your favorite books. Oh, I love reading, you know, rather than this book or that book, just to make the act of reading constant, continuous. Every day I try to read and it doesn't matter. I, I've never believed in this distinction between highbrow literature, lowbrow literature, who even decides? We can read political philosophy, we can read cookbooks, graphic novels, but always keep reading. And I think it should be eclectic, you know, fiction and nonfiction, East and West. But are there books that you just constantly go back to? Um, I love poetry, from Kawafi to Walt Whitman. I do read a lot of poetry. And I love discovering new books, as well as rereading some of my old favorites, like Virginia Woolf's Orlando is a book that I must have read so many times, for instance, or Walter Benjamin, a thinker whom I respect so much. Beautiful. How about films? So many. I can't, you know, from Terry Gilliam's Brazil to Jim Jarmusch movies. And finally, poems. Mm. Any favorite poets? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. For this book in particular, I went, I revisited Kavafi and, um, the, you know, the Greek, um, also Levant, uh, the, the poet from the Levant, I, would, I should say. Uh, I, I mean, so many, so many poets from the region and beyond, but I've been reading Kavafi a lot recently for, for, while I was writing this book. And last but not least, and, um, you have two children in London. You have your husband in London. You've been living in exile for a while. What do you think would take in terms of change in Turkey for you to be able to go and celebrate and visit safely and with joy? Yeah, it's a tough question because I think uh, Turkey is, of course, a beautiful country, but it's a very difficult environment for anyone who deals with words. So writers, journalists, poets, also cartoonists. I mean, if you want to defend the freedom of humor, being able to laugh at people in power, in authority, your life can be very difficult. Uh, if I may add this very quickly, I think what countries like Turkey have demonstrated very clearly is how fragile democracy can be. 
I do have a lot of respect for the ballot box for elections, but in itself, having a ballot box is not enough to sustain a democracy. In Turkey, we do have elections. Turkey is not a democracy. In addition to the ballot box, you need rule of law, separation of powers. Nobody in this life, no politician, no political party, or no tech company should have absolute power. So separation of powers is important and also is um, a free and diverse media, independent academia, women's rights, minority rights, LGBTQ rights, together with all these components, a democracy can survive and thrive. So all I'm trying to say is democracy is a very delicate ecosystem of checks and balances, and it needs to be nourished. It needs to be cared for. And countries, I believe, sometimes can go backwards, as it happened in Turkey. Countries can tumble into more religiosity, more ultranationalism, populist authoritarianism, when and if that happens, I think we women have much more to lose because the first rights that will be curbed will be women's rights and minority rights. That's so true. Elif, my mother, who passed away two decades ago, but at one point her best friend, who was an artist, was killed in, a, in an American bomb. Uh, by an American bomb, rather, that fell on her house and died. And she got killed. And my mom called me and she, she was crying. And she said, when the artist dies, all else dies. When the artist dies, all else dies. And as I speak with you today, the words that comes to mind is the artist is alive and kicking <laughs> and it's vibrant the artist is here the artist is the artist is not going anywhere <laughs> and it gives me hope so the artist is alive ladies and gentlemen and she's here with me Elif Shafak thank you so 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 much Elif Zainab thank you so much I'm so grateful for that. may I say you give me hope as well so shall we also add sisterhood is alive yeah. oh absolutely sisterhood is alive absolutely <laughs> That was Elif Shafak. Her latest novel, The Island of Missing Trees, is available now wherever books are sold. For transcripts and other resources from this episode, please go to www.findcenter.com slash redefined. You can follow Elif on Instagram at Shafak Elif. You can follow Find Center on Instagram at find underscore center. You can follow me at Zainab Salbi. And please email me questions about this podcast and your own transformative moments at redefined at findcenter.com. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next week for another conversation about life's turning points and lessons learned. My guest will be the great Hugh Jackman. Redefine is produced by me, Zainab Selby, along with Rob Carso, Casey Khan, and Howie Khan at Free Time Media. Our music is by John Palmer. Special thanks to Ur Chambilan, Neil Goldman, Carolyn Pincus, Shara Johnston, and Elijah Townsend. Looking forward to seeing you next time.